from Los Angeles, California. Ever increasing faith. With pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day, and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. We have been, and we are, in the process of teaching on the subject of the Christian family. And as the title implies... It will be dealing with and discussing things that have to do with family life. The reason that I'm doing this, and I do it at the beginning of each session, because we will be dealing with some subject areas that I know certain people have problems dealing with in a public forum. And so in order to cover my tracks, as it were, and to so that the people that are listening will get the maximum benefit out of it, I preface each session by laying a little groundwork about what I'm going to be talking about so that if you have a problem with some of these areas that I will mention then you can either cut your TV set off or maybe tape it so that you can play it later and edit it because I know we have children that watch the program and you may not want your children to, to hear some of the things that I may say and so uh, consequently I want to give you this forewarning so that there aren't any disgruntled or people that are surprised and shocked and then spend, waste all your stamps writing me a letter. So. The, the, the title, Christian Family, implies that we're going to be talking about the family, family and family life. We're going to be talking about it from God's perspective, from what the Bible says about it, not from what the world system says about family life. In the process of doing that, we inevitably will talk about husbands, about wives, about parents, about children, perhaps about um, children that are of adult age, of marriage age, yet may, they may still be living at home. And then uh, we're going to be talking about husbands and wives from the standpoint of interpersonal relationships relative to the family. So that will inevitably bring us to the discussion of sex. And some people have a problem with discussing sex, privately or publicly, but especially in a public forum like this. And so in order not to appear crass and vulgar, I'm letting you know in advance that I may be touching on some of these issues in this session, I don't know for sure because everything depends on how far I get and how the Spirit of God leads us in terms of revealing things about the subject that we'll be talking about this, uh, this morning. I do know that at a certain point in the series, I'm going to be touching on four problem areas that I consider to be very important problem areas, and one of those is sex, and so I'll probably definitely be spending much of the time in that session discussing the things concerning sex. So if that's vulgar to you, and if you have a problem with that, then, as I say, it will give you an opportunity to either move out, cut off your TV, or take your children out so that they won't be subjected to this if you don't want them to hear it. Because I don't know exactly how I'm going to say what I'm going to say. You see, I don't, everybody's different, but I don't really, I do in a very, very limited way, but I really don't spend as much time preparing messages as I do preparing me. See, I spend most of my time in preparation of me. Some men spend a lot of time in preparation of a lot of, a ma a lot of manuscripts and messages, and that's fine, that's no problem with that, but each person is different. I find that no matter what I would prepare, it's very difficult to minister to this many people and reach all of the individual needs that are represented here. Now we do this, what we're doing now, we do this three times in a row. There's one right behind the other, so that's quite a few people. I found out that the Holy Ghost knows better how to meet your need than I do. So I found out that when I make myself ready and prepare me, that he'll bring things up uh, that will meet your need that I never would have thought of. Are you following? Yet what I might say would be very good and helpful, but I want to meet as many needs, and God wants to, as many needs as humanly possible. So I prepare myself rather than a message per se. I do prepare, I do study, I do things, but not to the extent that I do in terms of preparing myself. So I never know. Sometimes I can't hardly wait to get to church to find out what I am going to say. 
I ain't really to find out how I'm going to say it. And I'm as amazed as you are many times at what I say and what comes out of my mouth. So I don't pre-plan how I'm going to say it. And I know, knowing me and knowing how the Spirit of God has used me in the last 16 years, I'm a very, very down-to-earth, right down where we live, right where your foot meets the pavement, where the rubber meets the road. And so some people can't handle that. So I want to say it in front so that there won't be mis any misunderstandings and you won't consider me vulgar, you won't be offended, or I won't do something that will offend you because I intend to let it all hang out. Okay? Because in terms of the people that I have to minister to and the letters we receive, uh, it needs to be dealt with. And it doesn't need to be dealt with in some closet somewhere. It needs to be dealt with on nationwide television. Okay? And so that's what I'm going to be doing. So if you have a problem with sex, and it, it, as I sense myself getting ready to say something, because even in the context of what we're talking about today, which is the duties of the wife, we may get into some areas and I may say something concerning sexual matters. If, if I'm aware of it and I sense that the Spirit of God is prompting me to say that, I'll probably try to wait even right then and let you know. Because I see that there's some young people in here and I don't, want, I don't want anybody to be offended, but I do want to deal with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Okay? So that's our format. So if you get offended after all of that, then you really have a serious problem. I will suggest you get saved. Okay? Now, we've already talked about marriage a divine ordinance. We've talked about marriage and divorce, the obligation. How obligated are we to stay with our mates? We talked about what I call another view, which had to do with divorce, looking at it from a non-traditional viewpoint. And I know that it helps somebody, some person. Then we talked about the duties of the husband. And we are talking now about the duties of the wife. And as I ask you for some feedback to give me some, some, some things that you might think of that perhaps you have experienced or know of that I did not mention, I want to be as thorough as possible. I'm really in no hurry. If we don't get through with this series until next year, that won't be a problem for me whatsoever. Because I believe family life will be going on until next year too. So we'll, we'll need it whenever we get to it. So I'm not in a big hurry. And so as new things come, I'm not, I have no problem with injecting them. So periodically I might have to reach back and retrace some steps and say something that's, that's good enough to be said, even though it may have, we've already, I may have already covered that particular area, such as the duties of the husband. Something else might come up that I might want to say about that, so I reserve that right, okay? Now, uh, we want to talk about the duties of the wife. I was talking last time about what is the obligation of a wife to pray with her husband or with her children. And I really left off with it at a very, very uh, inopportune time. In fact, the very last thing I said was, I, my wife and I never pray together, and then I had to go off the air. So that doesn't look too cool. But no problem. I, I covered this when I dealt with the husband, but I, it, 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 can, it, it can be said again, and then we have new people all the time anyway. Uh, because there is an old adage, uh, the family that prays together stays together. But uh, as the old song once said, it ain't necessarily so. Just because you pray together, that's not a guarantee you'll stay together. Because if you don't know how you, what to pray about in the first place or how to pray, you're still going to mess up. But uh, I think the obligation that a wife has to pray with her husband or children, I think certainly somebody should pray with the children and lead them. So a husband and wife have to get into some kind of agreement as to who's going to lead the child, especially a, especially a child who has accepted Christ as their Savior, even a young child. They certainly need some guidance. And then those that are not saved yet, they need some guidance to guide them into, uh, direct them to the place where they can get saved. But now we're talking about the husband and wife. How obligated is the wife, or is it an obligation or a duty of the wife to pray with the husband? Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about it one way or the other. The Bible simply says pray without ceasing. The Bible says to pray, but it doesn't tell you whether you have to do it with your husband or with your wife. And as I was saying last time, my wife and I, we, for all practical intents and purposes, we never pray together. And the only reason we don't is because our habits are different. Now, whenever there's something we need to get into agreement on, that both of us are concerned with, and we make a project out of it, then of course we get together on that and we agree on that, but that doesn't take but a couple of seconds anyway. And then that's done. But in terms of a regular, ongoing, devotional time, spending time together, or spending time with the Lord, I should say, my wife and I, we never do. 
And the reason we don't is because, as I said, our habits are different. The things, the way we do things are different. My wife, it takes her a little time to wake up. She doesn't just hit the floor and is wide awake. You know, she is awake, but it still just seems like it takes some time for her brain and her body and everything to just get hooked up and in sync. You know what I mean? And so she likes to get out of the bed, go in the kitchen, put on a pot of coffee, sit down at the table, have her coffee, read the word first, and then right immediately after that, pray. Well, see, my habits are different. I don't like to do that. I wake up like that. I'm awake. When my feet hit the floor, basically I am awake. So what I like to do is pray first. I like to do my praying first. And then I get ready to leave the house. Shave, clean up, get dressed, and the whole thing. And then I read as a last thing. I like to read that just before I leave the house. See, so we're, our, our, our times are different. Our needs are different. So that's the reason that we don't pray together. However, I have no concern because I know my wife is praying. That's the bottom line. Is your wife praying? Is your husband praying? Don't make an issue out of it and don't break up a good marriage just because your husband doesn't pray with you or your wife doesn't pray with you. As long as they're praying. Now, you've got some guys that'll try to jive you and say, well, I'm praying, I'm praying, but you never see him praying no time, no where, no how. Then you should be a little suspect of that. Because somewhere along the line, they ought to see you at least doing it. So, I would say that something like that is something that the two of you agree on. Whatever works the best for you. If it works well for the whole family to pray together, then absolutely pray together. But if it doesn't, don't break up your marriage over it. It's not that important. What's important is that you pray. Not when you pray, or where you pray, or your posture of prayer, or whether you pray with your husband or wife, or the dog, or the cat, or the frog. The main thing is as long as you pray. Okay? That's what's important. And one thing, a duty of a wife is, just like it's the duty of the husband, is to pray without ceasing. So you definitely should spend some time in prayer. Now, you wives, don't take your husband for granted. You have a duty to, to encourage, to inspire, to, to commend your husband. Let him know that he's the best, if he is the best. Now, in your prayer time, you can confess that he's the best, but don't lie to him and tell him face to face that he is when he's not. But you do it in prayer. You know, confess that over him in prayer. But if your husband's done something good, he's doing things, he encourage you. He like, just like you like to be told you look good. Your husband likes to, to hear that. Your hair looks nice. You're, you're, that's a beautiful time. Uh, you know, you're looking good. You're my man. I better not let you out of the house today. Some little filly might pick you up. I better go with you today. But that's what makes a guy feel good. You know? And some need it more than others. You know? But don't just take him for granted. Just like you like to be complimented, it won't hurt to compliment your man. And I believe that's the duty of the wife. I believe if you look at the Word, Jesus and the Lord tells us when we've done things good. You know what I mean? He, he blesses us and commends us. And we ought to learn how to do that for our mates. And so that's the duty of the Word. Don't just take him for granted. I mean, compliment him when, it, when, when he should be complimented. Encourage him. A little soft word here go a long way to help to cement the relationship. To make it even that much more fruitful and productive. So don't take him for granted. Tell him when his hair looks good. Tell him he smells good, if he smells good. When he smells bad, you're going to tell him, I hope. I hope you tell him when he smells bad. Don't let him out of the house smelling bad. Huh? Amen. So those are, those are good things. All right. Wives, don't just be a receiver. Don't just let your husband do everything for you. Everything good to you, and all you do is receive from him and never give back anything. Of yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Learn how to be a giver too. Don't just receive. Don't just be the one waited upon all the time. Learn how to wait upon him. It's a two-way street. It goes a long way. He'll appreciate that. Just like you appreciate it. See? Don't just, don't just receive, but also give. Be a giver. Give of yourself. And I don't mean just in the things you're supposed to do as a wife, some things that some wives do out of duty, but there's no real them in it. It's just a wifely thing, you know you're supposed to do it, so you do it, but there's no them, vigor, and vitality in it. That's what I'm talking about. So be sure that you do that, and you, 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 it'll be a blessing to your man. Okay? Don't just receive, but also be a giver. Now... What do you do 
with a wife, or what's the duty of a wife, where you have one of the, a wife that's always, she'd want to be alone. Got to get away, you know. She just sort of disappears for a while. Or have to go off, you know, to be alone. Well, that's why, one reason you got married, because you were lonely. Now you're married and you want to go off somewhere. You should have stayed unmarried. Now, that's not to say there wouldn't be times when, you know, maybe you should get together with some of the ladies and go to the women's retreat, just like the men go to the men's advance or on a fishing trip or something like that or a shopping spree or whatever. But I'm talking about just this, this thing of where you're always by yourself, getting alone, away from the children, away from your husband. I mean, that's, there, you know, there's something suspect with that. What I mean, I don't mean you're necessarily doing anything wrong, but I mean, what's the motivation? Why do you have to be alone? Why do you want to be alone? Why, what did you get married for? I mean, marriage, the Bible, we read it, I don't know how many times as we've gone through this lesson, this series, Genesis, well, I almost memorized it now, Genesis, what, 2.24, where it talks about when a man leaves his father and mother and he joins to his wife and they two become one flesh. That doesn't mean like you going somewhere and being by yourself, ladies. Huh? Hmm? No. I don't ever want to be, I don't ever want my wife to, to go away anywhere. I like my wife. I like her around. I, I just, I just, the house feels better when my wife's home. You know, just, just something about it. I don't, when she talks about how she's got to go somewhere or go off somewhere, I, I don't like that. <laughs> I mean, I know she has to go sometimes, you know. But I just would much rather be home. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's nice having her around the house. Having her presence there. It does something to the atmosphere. But uh, you wives that always want to go off somewhere and then don't want to tell your husband where you're going. And don't want to tell him where, where you've been. You may not even be doing anything. But that's just not wisdom. I mean, wherever you go that you can't tell your husband you've been there, you don't have no business going there. <laughs> Amen. Why, you, why would you want to go there and create all this suspicion? I mean, who needs that? Are you following me? So I, I, I think a duty of a wife is to be that. Be the wife, be the helpmate, not be a, a hermit. Go off somewhere by yourself. All the time. As I said, there can be some stated times, you know, uh, when you decide to do some things, maybe with, with a friend of yours, uh, girlfriends, they go out and go to lunch and go shopping and stuff like that. Well, that, that's all right. But, but use some wisdom in that. Now, there's another thing I want to deal with. This came up, actually, uh, it, it came up with the, with the duties of the husband. If you will remember when I talked about the wives working, you remember that? And I gave you this presentation. And this person, when I asked for notes on duties of the husband, gave me this one. But I reserved it till now because I wanted to include it in the context of the wife. Because I think what was happening is the person was trying to make a case for or find scripture that would allow wives to work. In other words, a Bible verse that would indicate, well, you see here, Fred, here it is right here in the Bible, and it's all right for women to work. Well, I said that. I mean, I said that when we talked about that. I have no problem with the wife working, or a woman working, if that's what you want. All I told you was I didn't want my wife to work. That's all. What, what you do is no problem. I have no problem with it. I don't think the Bible, I think there's some, def we read it, some definite things that a wife ought to do. But that's not to say that you know, the Bible doesn't cover every aspect of your total married life in terms of how many years you've been married. Because there would eventually get to a point where your kids won't be home. You'll be there by yourself. You may be in good enough shape. You've got a gardener. You've got a maid, a butler, a housekeeper. And there's nothing for the wife to do. She may be talented. She may have expertise in certain areas. Why couldn't she use those things to advantage, both for the family, even for the kingdom of God? So there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. You see what I mean? But I was dealing with the thing where a man requires his wife to work because he wants another this or another that or some more of those or some of those and they don't have enough, he doesn't make enough money so he requires it and puts pressure on his wife and it's, it's, you know, the wife really doesn't want to work and it's a hassle. That's what I was dealing with. Now here's the scripture. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 31 and let's read this because this is commonly used, not for this particular subject, but it's commonly used relative to uh, talking about a wife and I want to read it and make some comments on it. Proverbs, the 31st chapter, 31. As I say, the, the, 
Now this might not be the person's intent, let me say that, when they gave me the note. But as I read uh, the note and, and, and the, the scripture verse, that was the impression that I got, okay? That, that might not have been the intent. But that was the impression I was left with, that it was sort of like, and it wasn't argumentative or anything like that. It was just like saying, well, here's one that perhaps you didn't see or you didn't recognize. I believe this one speaks to the issue of a woman working. Well, I think the person, they did miss something in the story, but I'd like to read it anyway because some others may have had the same idea but just didn't voice them. All right, Proverbs 31, and we'll begin with verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Now underline the word worketh. There might be a little indication there, you know, if you want to see that in there, that this is talking about working. See? All right, let's go on. Verse 14. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her husband, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Now see that statement right there could get, you know, might get the idea that maybe this is what she's talking about, being a salesperson or something like that. I don't know. Verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and all her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children ri arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now, I, I think that what needs to be dealt with here is that you have to understand the times in which this was talking. And for a Jewish woman, that was a very customary thing. I mean, that was the way a good virtuous woman would act, see. And it's been taken out and used as, a, as a, an illustration for a virtuous woman today, and there's much merit in it, no doubt about that. But I don't think you could take that verse and use it as a... As a a proof text to prove that women can go out and work 40 hours a week and punch a clock. Okay, I don't think, don't use it for that. Because what she did was not go out and work 40 hours a week. If you, if you look at it very carefully, she was taking care of her family. But that was the way they did it in those days. It wasn't where she was going and leaving the kids, leaving the husband, going to the factory or to the office and working 40 hours a week. That's not talking about the same thing. But like I said, I have no problem with women working. I don't really see that the Bible does. I do believe that there are some things that a woman, if she does them, will make, make for a home that will, will fit more securely into the concept that God has for us. But I realize that a lot of times we have been governed by the world system of doing things. And in the world system, husband, wife, dog, cat, and the frog work. Because if you don't, you're not going to have many of this world's goods, see? And that's just customary. The ideal, I believe, I still believe it. I've said it before. I believe it now. I've lived in it. I know what it can do. That the ideal is that a wife stay home and be a housemaker, be a housewife, take care of her children, take care of her husband. There may be a, part, a point at which that, having been done, and everybody's out and gone from the house, that the woman may have abilities and talents and go ahead and use those abilities and talents for reasons. But not because if she doesn't work, you're going under financially. That's my only position. And again, I'm not God, so it doesn't make any difference what, you th what I think anyway. You can still do what you want. I did it in my, my household. It worked out fine. No problem. I think it helped us in our family. I think it's a, a tremendous help. And yet, there are reasons why a person might work. So I don't think the Bible, per se, just tells a woman that she can't work. So I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think that this verse in Proverbs could be used as a proof text 
Don't use it as a proof text as to why you should work. If you believe you ought to work and want to work and your husband's in agreement with it, go on and work. No problem. As long as you can do all the things that you need to do, you know, as far as the Word of God said, then I don't see a real problem with it. Of course, that's just one man's opinion, but praise the Lord. All right, now, there were some other questions that came in that I want to tack on here to the end of this family uh, or to the duties of the wife. Did I... Um, I started to do this one in the 8 o'clock and they said I already read it. I have just so many things and I'm in three services doing the same message and I'm not always... They, they don't always come right together. Did I talk about um, in this service about... All right, let me, let me read it. Uh, Dear Pastor Price, with respect to the man being head of the house and the fact that there is very little concerning the duties of the wife in the Bible, how can the man be head of the household if the wife owns the house and feels that the husband has no say in matters of the house except for financial input? I didn't read that one here. I didn't read that one. Do you wives want me to read this one? I said, do you wives want me to read this one? I know the husbands do. I don't have to ask them. Okay. All right, listen to this. Dear Pastor Price, with respect to the man being head of the house and the fact that there is very little concerning the duties of the wife in the Bible, how can the man be head of the household if the wife owns the house and feels that the husband has no say in matters of the house except for financial input? I am of the opinion that no matter who owns the house, the husband is still the head. However, my wife views this differently. She is also of the opinion that her house is for her children and they can come and go as they please and I am to have no say in the matter. We also have separate banking accounts because my wife has rental property and doesn't believe that this is to be shared or again that I have a say in matters pertaining to her property. We are both Bible toting, pen marking, tongue talking Christians. Well, I, I know I dealt with one facet of this uh, when it had to do with whether the, uh, when I dealt with the husband's duties of the husband, suppose he had a wife that made more money than him. I don't care how much money the wife makes. That doesn't impact, the amount, of, the amount of money that you make and bring into the house is not what qualifies you to stand as head. And the man doesn't stand as head because he makes more money than the wife. That is God's divine order. The reason the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, or appears to do so, is because that's a divine order and you can't change it. So you better just live with it. Okay? So a man, a Christian man, in a Christian home, in a Christian context, is the head of the house, not because he makes more money, but because that's God's order concerning rank. God the Father, God the Son, man, woman, children. That is the domestic rank and order. That's the way it is. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. I would say this, that you married to a doozy. <laughs> you are married to a humdinger, as my father used to say. I think that this is really pathetic and sad. She is also of the opinion that her house is for her children and they can come and go as they please. I tell you what, I'd be coming and going as I please, too. <laughs> Permanently. That's certainly not the way Christ treats the church. That is not the way Jesus treats the church. And I personally, you know, you can't find this in the Bible per se, but I think that's horrendous. That's awful. That's terrible. I think her attitude smells bad. I started to say stink, but I think smells bad sound did <laughs> That's terrible, though. And that her children can come and go as they please, and I have no say-so in the matter. Honey, if you don't have no say-so in the matter, you are not the head of the house. That is a pathetic situation in which they have to live. It seems peculiar because you would think that they had this, that she, the way he's talking, she had this property and this before they got married. It seemed like they would have talked about it or something and not have gotten into it. If he went into it with her attitude like that, he's getting exactly what he deserves. He's getting exactly what he deserves. 
We also have separate banking accounts because my wife has rental property and doesn't believe that this is to be shared. She needs to get saved. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. We are both Bible tote and pen marking, tongue talking. I wonder what kind of tongues are they talking in? Not they, but her. And what kind of pen is she marking? And what kind of Bible is she toting? You might be toting it, but she's sure not reading it. I think that's, that's really sad. That's not, that is not the duty of a wife, to treat her husband like that. Everything becomes ours. There is no such thing as our, uh, your, my, mine, and yours. It's ours. So sure glad I don't have to deal with something like that. Bless his heart. Well, brother, we pray for you. You got a that, that's something you can pray for her. No doubt you can pray for her and bind that spirit, whatever it is. Because you know what that is? That's the spirit of the world. See that, and what that shows is that that's a person that is not exercising any faith whatsoever. They're not trusting God to be the source. She's trusting her money and houses and all that stuff. She should be glad to share it. Should be, I believe, anyway. But anyway, that's not very wifely. Now, we have another. We have several here that are just really good. Really good. Husbands that leave their... So what's the duty of a wife? See, we're looking at the duty of a wife. Husbands that leave their wives alone at home all the time. I married him, not four walls. I need companionship too. Please allow me to explain. Besides going to work in church, I am at home the rest of the time. My husband takes me nowhere. He eats out, goes to the movie, and goes to play pool. He says he needs recreation. What about me? And even goes shopping and never wants to take me with him. All my money goes into the pot and pays bills, all of which he has made and continually makes all of his own. It is lonely being at home day after day. He thinks that he is being less than a man to call and let me know where he is or to inform me of his whereabouts. Sometimes he even stays out all night. By the way, I am talking about a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, active-in-church husband sitting under the word at Crenshaw Christian Center for eight years. But now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now see, wait, you see, you have to understand. Wait a minute, that's not, that's not a bad mark for Crenshaw Christian Center. See, you, you didn't hear what he said. Listen, listen, listen. I am talking about a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, active in-church husband sitting under the Word at Crenshaw Christian Center for eight years. See, that's what happened. A whole lot of folks sit under the Word. See, the Bible doesn't say, but be ye sitters under the Word. The Bible says, be ye doers of the Word. There's a vast difference. Just because somebody's in church, even Crenshaw Christian Center, that's no guarantee that they're for right or that they're right. I mean, after all, Judas walked with Jesus for three and a half years and then ended up betraying him. Huh? So if, if, if somebody could walk with Jesus physically, personally, and hear his words and see his life for three and a half years and then end up selling him out for 30 pieces of silver, it is conceivable that somebody could be Bible-toting, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, sitting in Crenshaw Christian Center for eight years doing nothing. Pastor Price, as a husband, thank you for your love and concern for us wives. I appreciate you and Betty very much. Thanks again. Now, this lady, I believe this wife should have one million American Beauty roses sent to her. I believe she ought to have a golden crown encrusted with emeralds, rubies, and diamonds. Now, why do I say that? Sounds a little facetious. No. She deserves that for her to stay there like that. He would have one time to stay out on me. Just once. One. <laughs> Uno. One. Bless you, sister. You all right. 
Now, what I would say, now, you know, we, I had uh, the last couple of weeks, I got a couple of letters. My wife read these letters. Now, I, I, it's been very few times since I've been filled with the Spirit, especially, and been walking by the Word. It's been very few times in the 16 years that I've been walking in the Word where I have been caught without something to say. You know, not knowing what to say. I, I've never been at a loss for words. And, but these letters were absolutely, really the worst situations. They were so bad, I couldn't even, I had to ask my wife to read the letters, see if you can find out some kind of way, how can we help these people? Because I only saw one solution. And I knew I better not give that solution. <laughs> I only could see one way out. Only one. And I, you know, I, I'm still meditating on what, I'm, what I can do with these letters. Uh, the people need some help. I mean, they, they need some help. They, their help needs some help. And I didn't know just exactly how to deal with it. I mean, I'm really, I, I have been few, very few times I just didn't know what to do. I mean, even with the word, I didn't know how to tell these people what to do because their, their situations are horrendous. Some of the worst I, I've, I've ever read about. But now, on this situation here, now, I, you see, I can't tell somebody to get a divorce, even though I want to. Oh, yeah. Divorce is better than murder. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, they're both sin, but you've taken somebody's life in murder. I mean, that's, you know, sin is bad enough to, to sin and take somebody's life. But I, here's what I would say with this situation here. Like I say, he'd have one time not to come home to me. And I'd not know where he is. Just once. That's all. No problem whatsoever. He'd look for me and I'd be gone. Bye. Amy, you think I'm lying? No way. No way. No way. That is, the Jesus does not treat the church that way. See, the Bible said, we read it about the husband. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That is not the way that a husband that's a spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Bible-toting Christian, that is not very becoming of a child of the king. But what I, my advice, what I tell that woman to do, I tell her the next time he goes out, I'd go out. Next time he goes play pool, goes to play pool, I'd go play pool. Or whatever you want to do, jacks or what, whatever. <laughs> Give him, see what you have to do sometimes, ladies, and this is, that's why I say bless your dear darling heart, you need to jack some of these jokers up sometimes. Give them a taste of their own medicine. See, I didn't say divorce them. See, the Bible talks about divorce. It does not talk, in the, it does not talk about leaving that dude. Separate. You don't have to get a divorce. But let him, let him feel it. it. Because I tell you right now, you might as well find out now. If he doesn't love you enough to stay with you, the best thing to do is find out right now. Why you still got some life left. So you can go do something else. No point staying around there for the next 25 years trying out that guy doesn't like you. And then your, your youth is gone. You, you're dead. You're gone. Uh-uh. Find You might as well find out now. Put him to the test. Put some pressure on that dude. When he leaves, you leave. You go out. Don't tell him. You stay out all night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Give him a taste of his own medicine. See, men, this is, and this all comes from the world system. Men will do that because you let them. A lot of the a lot of the activity that husbands do against their wives and the way they act, you're not gonna like this, but I'm gonna say it because I want you to get the point. You dumb broads have let them get away with it. <laughs> No point in looking funny. You have, you caused it. You've done it. You let him, I'm telling you, you, one time, just one time, don't come home and you be gone. If he loves you, really wants you, he'll straighten up and fly right or else you can go. Like I say, you don't have to divorce him. You ain't got nothing living with him. You might as well live by yourself. You don't have nothing. He's gone and leaves you alone. You might as well be alone. Be alone, alone. <laughs> Instead of being married alone, are you following? I mean, married and in, in, in the same household. 
That's mistreatment. Go off and don't tell her. Don't even call her and let her know where you are. I mean, she don't know whether you're dead or what. And then you bringing your money home? Honey, put that money somewhere else. Put it in a bank account of your own. Don't put it in the pot and he's taking the money and making bills with it and they won't even have the courtesy to come home? You're a fool. You deserve just what you get. That's right. That is not... See, now understand this. Like I say, see, you cannot help a person by condoning their actions. You don't help them. Now, when you have a guy like that that is supposed to be saved and filled with the Spirit and under the Word, see, you can't use the Word on somebody like that. I mean, he's he got deaf ears. I mean, he has feared his conscience. You, I mean, you've got to do, do something else to get his attention. And I tell you what, it'll get his attention fast. Like I said, and it'll help you to find out where you are in this relationship. No point wasting your whole life. I don't believe that's the will of God. For you to spend a bunch of lonely nights the rest of your life while he's playing footloose and fancy free out there in the street. That is mistreatment, and, and Jesus would not treat the church that way. See, I, I, like I said, I have the, you had the first time to leave me. Just one time, that's it. Just once. See, and that's what's wrong with some of you women. You act, you, you, you treat that guy and make him think he's God. And that, you know, the world can't do without him. And so then he just runs over you. Why shouldn't he run over you? You know he's got a fool there at home. You're going to be there when he gets back. What? He can go do what he wants. You're going to be there. You'll be there. You let him come home and find you not there and his food not ready. That's mistreatment. Now see, remember this. Now here's something else you need to think about. Think about this. We're talking about the duties of the wife. In other words, what's her position or response? Think about this. That wife is somebody's daughter. That's somebody's daughter you're messing with. Now, I don't know about anybody else. Different strokes for different folks. But I tell you what, my wife and I, and, and I hope you can, well, my wife and I went through you know what to raise our children. It cost us blood, sweat, and tears. It cost us all kinds of stuff. And I didn't raise my wife, my children rather, for some hard head to mess over them. You got your first time to mess with my daughter. Now, I know that this is the old thing about where you should never get involved with anybody's family. You shouldn't get involved with family. You want to bet? <laughs> you want to bet? That's my child? My wife went through nine months of carrying that child? Body torn up? Going through all those changes for nine months to carry that baby and birth that baby and then stay with that baby and raise that baby and put up with all the garbage out of that baby's mouth and attitude while they were growing up and maturing. And then I'm going to let some hard head, slick talking guy come there and mess over my child? You must be out of your mind. You must be out of your mind. I, all I need to do is find out that he left and didn't come back that night. I would personally drive by and pick my child up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, see, I don't know what your kids mean to you. Like I say, different stories for different folks. Man, my, my children are precious to me. I ain't let nobody mess over them. Because, see, not one of my kids, I have only two of them that are married and still have two at home, but not one of those married daughters that, 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 that are married now, they did not leave home because they had to leave home. They had a good home, and they could have stayed there for the next 900 years if that was their choice. No problem. So when they went, they went because they wanted to, because that was the choice that they made. My children mean a lot to me, and you ain't going to mess over them. You're not going to mess with them. Now, I said all of that. You better listen to this. I said all of that 
he ain't going to let you mess over his kids either. Sooner or later, you're going to get yours. You better cool it. I said you better cool it. Yeah, you got your first time to, to mess over my kids. I'll get involved in your relationship. You don't want to hear from me. Best thing to do is treat them right. Because I'm checking up on you. I got an investment there, honey, and I'm checking up on my investment. I ain't let nobody mess over my investment. You don't want to see me coming or hear from me. Treat her right. And I'll know about it. What I don't see with my eye, the Holy Ghost will reveal. Oh, yeah. That's right. So this kind of action here, this is, uh, this, is, this is certainly not a Christian way to treat somebody. But what I say to you, why you got somebody like that, you do, do, give him the same thing he does, you do it. And if he doesn't like you, you say, well, hey, wait a minute, that's the way you treat me. See, especially if these Christian guys, and he, he, he want to talk about, talk about he, he, he has the right to do this and the other, this, that, or the other, and he's sitting under the word for eight years, say, well, wait a minute, brother. Husband, darling, doesn't the Bible say that you're supposed to treat me like Christ treats the church? Is this the way Christ treats the church? Now, if he won't hear that, like I said, you might as well find that out quick. So you can make other arrangements. Whatever those arrangements need to be. But I don't believe the duty of the wife is to stay home and be mistreated like that. Now, see, you might say, well, that ain't so bad. I know some women and the guy beats up on them. Hey, whether you get beat up verbally or beat up physically or beat up by being left alone. That's still a beating up on you. Huh? Sometimes it's a whole lot easier to recover from somebody hitting you upside your head than it is to deal with something that happened to you on the inside. Huh? Because this will heal up fast. Won't be very long, that bump will be gone. Scar tissue will form over there, and that's, it's over. But some of those things that people are carrying here inside, they've been carrying them for years. They don't heal up that easy. In the natural. So you've got to deal with that. All right. Now, all right, wife, did I say everything you told me to say? Did, did I say everything you... Okay, I just want to be sure. I want to be sure I was reading the cue cards right. Rightly. All right, now here's another one. You know, we read the scripture. I won't return... I won't go there. Well, let's, let's look at it. First Corinthians uh, chapter 7. Remember we talked about defrauding one the other? We talked about the, the body, uh, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband, hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That's verses 4 and 5 of the second, of 1 Corinthians, rather, chapter 7. Now, why, what's the wife's duty or responsibility? Now, like I told you at the outset, I'm getting ready to say something now. This is going to be very intimate. This will be very personal type thing. So if you have a child and you don't want them to hear it, if you have a child that's here in the building, you may put your hands over their ears if you don't want to hear this. I mean, it's just natural stuff that happens every day, but some folk have a problem with it. But, but, but here we go. Because this, this may be your situation. You may need this. Um, what is the duty of a wife towards a husband who absolutely insists on having sexual intercourse while she's right in the middle of her menstrual cycle. And uses the scripture, defraud that your body belongs to me. So defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time to give yourself to fasting and prayer. Now if you were under the old covenant you'd be in serious trouble. Because that woman was considered unclean, and you put yourself in jeopardy. But what, what do you do with a man that that's insists upon having sexual intercourse during the menstrual cycle? Well, you, one good thing that we find, find out about this man, we know one thing, we know this man's not praying and fasting. Because if he can't wait for the average of from four to five days for the average menstrual cycle. And you've got basically, well, it's a 28-day cycle, but, you know, you have basically 30 days in a month. So you're talking about, if you go at the furthest extremity, five days, 
you got 25 days left, and you can't contain yourself for five days, you need that lust demon cast out of you. That's not a biological need. That's just lust gone somewhere to happen. That needs to be cast out. You are a person out of control. You are dangerous not only to your wife but to yourself if you can't control yourself for five days. You are totally undisciplined. You really need to get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. You got a real problem. I mean, that's just greed. That's just greedy. And especially when you know your wife doesn't want to, doesn't want to do that. See, you don't realize it, some of you hard-headed men, you don't realize it, your wife's body goes through a change every 28 days. I mean, it's not, it's not just the nicest thing for a woman to have to go through and have a, a menstrual cycle. It affects their body. It changes things. They, 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 they change on the inside. Some women experience quite a bit of, uh, of discomfort and pain. I know of some women, they, they're out of it. They're just out of it. I mean, you have, they have to go to bed. You know, I mean, they have medications and things, but I mean, some of them have really strong cramps and other things like that. And uh, they're, you know, they're just, I mean, they're out of it. It affects different people in different ways. But I think for a Christian man, I, now I'm going to use a statement now. This is, I know that in the, in the natural, this will be considered very crude and vulgar. But I only say it because I believe that we're dealing with a crude and vulgar person. And apparently, talking to them Bible talk, hasn't affected me. Maybe this will. <laughs> now, I don't, I, I, I'm telling you right now, close your ears because you'll really flip out on this one. But I think that it, it, I can't think of a better way to say it that illustrates the point, and I want to emphasize it because I believe it's just that important. Somebody that is so out of it that has to, to insist on his wife being available to him during the menstrual cycle. As I said, he's out of control. That's pure lust that's governing him. That's not even a biolo biological need. That's just lust and greed. And what you have is a man here who is allowing his lower head to control his upper head. Now, is that plain enough for you? Or do you want me to get a blackboard and draw a picture? Huh? But that is, that's, that's pathetic. Do you think that Jesus would treat the church that way? Why would you treat your wife that way? You need, you, brother, you need some deliverance. Beside that is smelling. I mean, it doesn't smell good. I mean, hygienically, my God. I mean, you really are desperate. <laughs> Plus, you open yourself up for a lot of other things because that's a time when uh, you could be very susceptible to uh, uh, bacteria and germs because one of the greatest things that bacteria and germs like to feed on, best thing in the world, the best culture in which they can develop is blood. I mean, they thrive on that. And you just, you're just sitting on top of a powder cake. If you have any, a scratch or anything like that, you can, you know, you can throw yourself open to an infection or anything like that. I mean, you don't need that. Unless there's something wrong with you. And if there is something wrong with you, thank God deliverance is at hand. You can come on down here and we'll cast it out. Amen. But I, I, I you know, I, I think that, uh, wife, you better pray. You know, you really better pray because that's really, um, I don't know what else to say. Even in, like I said, in the Old Testament, that God forbid that. And you have to realize that everything in the Old Testament and everything under the, under the Old Covenant wasn't just to make Israel different than the rest of the world. There were many, many things that had to do with health things. There were just some things that God knew that was health. It, was a, it had a health uh, benefit involved in it. Not just something, don't do this or don't do that, but it had something to do with health. But whoever that husband is, brother, you need some help. Really. Now, here's another one. At what age should parents... Now, now this one, we're getting ready to go... Uh, well, let me read this one, this other one. It's sort of tied together, but it sounds like it's one that has to do with children. Uh, should second husbands demand that their wives 
severs, this is the duty of a wife, that their wives sever the relationships with their offsprings of a previous marriage, forbidding them to live in the house with or visit their mother, even though the husband knew when he met, dated, and married that the children were living at home. Well, I don't believe the duty of the wife is to, to forego her children and to forget about her children that she had from another marriage. And if the guy knew about it in the first place, I, you know, that, he was a deceiver to marry her, think, uh, letting her think that that was all right. I mean, when you marry her, you marry her, you know, the children, they go with the game. Especially if they were already living there. You ought to have known that because you had to go pick her up sometime. And then to deny her the right to, to fellowship and, and, and have communication with her children, that is, uh, brother, you need some salvation. You need some, you, you need some help. I, I don't think that that's, uh, that that's appropriate. Now, here's another part of this same thing. At what age should parents put their children out of the house, out of the home? Well, personally, I believe that when the relationship is like it ought to be, I don't, I don't think there is any age where you put your children out of the home. I don't want my kids to go out of the house till they're ready to go. So they're ready to meet that man, and I've got to meet the man because I just ran out of time. We're not finished. Stay right where you are. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. This dynamic faith message you have just heard on today's ever-increasing faith program is now available on audio cassette to use in your personal Bible study or to share with your family and friends. The entire faith lesson presented on today's program is included on the tape and will be sent to you for your love gift in support of this ministry. Just write and request program CF13. Send your love gift to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, zip code 90009, and mention the call letters of this station. That's Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, zip code 90009. Ask for program CF13, allow four to five weeks for delivery, and join Dr. Price again for another hour of ever-increasing faith. Yeah.